My name is Timothy Alberino. I'm an author, researcher, and explorer. I have been researching in various fields for about 20 years. I have an interest in cryptids. I have an interest in meg megaliths, ancient civilizations, lost ancient civilizations, alternative history, ufology, Bigfoot, um, and Bible prophecy, and and other interests as well. But but those are probably the the topics that I'm most known for giants certainly and as i said i've been on this path for about 20 years and it all began for me when i moved to peru when i was 18 years old i dropped out of high school and i moved to the peruvian amazon the amazon basin where i spent some time living in uh, in the various in various jungle cities some of the time living living with some indigenous communities uh, civilized indigenous communities and with various acquaintances in in the amazon and uh, i really developed a, a thirst for adventure and and exploration during that period of time. And that's kind of where the journey began for me. So um, I've eventually, I moved back to the United States. I currently reside in Bozeman, Montana, and I've been published a book called Birthright some years ago. And I've been uh, on this, as I said, I've been on this track for a while now. So uh, I, have a, I have a wide range of, of research interests and have gone on various expeditions. I went and explored a, it discovered with my colleague Anselm Pirabla, we, we, we discovered a lost city in the Andes Mountains um, some years ago. And I've done research into the Paracas culture uh, and just, uh, I've been very busy for the last, especially over the last decade. I've made some films. I, I was working for a while with um, author Steve Quayle and we, we started a company called Gen 6 Productions and we created, a, um, we produced a few films in the True Legend series. Those films primarily, the content of those films is primarily related to giants. And I've been, I've been working on my own TV series for a while. That is, that features some of the more recent work I've been doing and uh, that is available for annual subscribers in my me members community. They, they can they can get a free screening, a, a, a pre-screening of the first three episodes in that series. So there's there's a lot. I have a lot going on, and I've got some upcoming film projects that I'm going to be working on this year. I'm very interested. I live in Montana, and I'm very interested in the the Bigfoot topic. So I have some projects related to Bigfoot coming up, and um, very intrigued by sasquatch and always doing i'm always doing something what do you feel and i'm curious to get your thoughts on this what do you feel is the connection between um bigfoot and nephilim i know that's a really ambiguous question but there's so many ways you can go with that i'm really curious to hear your thoughts with all the research you've done um and what you know i'm not sure there is a direct connection between nephilim and sasquatch it, it all it all depends on how you define Nephilim. Now, I I would opt for a a more limited definition of that term. Some people will take the term Nephilim and will apply it broadly. Right. There's a, there's a there's a broad spectrum of of creatures of things which for them fall into the category of Nephilim. For me, uh, that's in my opinion that's taking the term too liberally. It's 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 being too generous with the application of that of that term. I would constrain the meaning of Nephilim to within its its within the within the limits within the boundaries of 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 ancient Hebrew cosmology because that's where it comes from right and and in the ancient Near East in general and a Nephilim referred exclusively to a giant 
Nephilim is never used in the, in the biblical narrative for anything other than a giant. And indeed, the, 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 the word Nephilim, contrary to popular belief, is not derived from Hebrew. Rather, it's derived from the Aramaic. Mm. And, and the word in Aramaic means giant. And the, um, there's some confusion because some, some people have derived the term from the Hebrew, from the verb nephal, which means to fall. And so you have this, you have this, uh, this epithet, the fallen ones that's attached to Nephilim, to the word Nephilim, which sort of can encompass in people's minds will naturally encompass any, any nefarious creature any sort of non-human entity that's nefarious would fall under that definition of Nephilim. But, but the problem is that that's not the correct derivation for the word. The word comes from the Aramaic, as I said, and it means specifically, it, it designates a giant. And so my definition of the word Nephilim would be very limited to giants. Also, you have a situation in Hebrew cosmology in which, according to the Book of Enoch, the narrative that comes from First Enoch, especially the Ethiopic Enoch, but also the Greek fragments of Enoch, you have this narrative of the watchers who descended and copulated with human women and, and procreated a progenerated a race of giants in the earth. And those giants were the Nephilim. That's, where the, that's the origin of, of the giants in the biblical narrative. And, and as punishment, for this transgression, and it, this was a punishment on both the Watchers and their offspring, and the giants. When the giants died in the in the pre-flood context, they they were they had this bizarre curse placed upon them, in which their spirits w- would would henceforth become evil spirits or unclean spirits that would be that would wander the earth as vagabond wraiths. And they would have all of the desires of the flesh. They'd be hungry and thirsty, and, and assumedly they would have the sexual impulses of the flesh. But they would have no flesh with which to fulfill these desires. And this is very much, very much like the curse in the in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, where the pirates have the curse. I think it was of the Mayan gold, and they 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 have physical bodies, but they have no way to satiate their their hunger and their thirst in their physical passions and desires because they have this curse upon them and all they want to do is lift this curse. Well, this is, this is the condition of the dead Nephilim who wander the earth as, as bodiless, disembodied vagabond wraiths. And those also could be considered as Nephilim, but, but they have a different designation in the biblical narrative. They're called demons. And that is the origin of demons. So the origin of giants and of demons is derived from the same narrative, namely the Book of Enoch. And so, again, returning to the to the term, to the Nephilim terminology, I would I would constrain my definition of that term within the boundaries of Hebrew cosmology. I would not go beyond that using that term. So we're now let's address. Your question, which is Bigfoot, does Bigfoot have anything to do with Nephilim? Well, he is gigantic, that's for sure. I think most accounts of Bigfoot that I've heard in in concerning the males, certainly, a description of their stature ranging from anywhere from eight to ten feet tall in that general range, usually around eight or nine feet tall, very broad shoulders, very, very long stride. And so certainly the Nef- the, the Bigfoot could qualify as a giant, although it's not human. And the giants that were progenerated by the Watchers in the antediluvian world were humanoid. They, I believe that they could copulate with human women and produce offspring. And, uh, and this is attested in the Dead Sea Scrolls, whereas the Bigfoot creature is, is altogether inhuman. And so I, I think I, I, would, I would hesitate to apply the Nephilim terminology to, to, to Sasquatch. I think what we're looking at is 
and, and this is a developing view in my own mind, but, but currently the way that I view Sasquatch is this is a very ancient primordial creature, perhaps even a pre-Adamic creature that, is, that has been wandering the earth for a very, very long time. And I think that there's a, there's a primordial hybrid, uh, rather hominid, that this is, this is the, the very bestial Bigfoot, the Bigfoot that is very much like a, a smarter version of a grizzly bear or something like that. But then there's, but then there's a, a, perhaps, a subspecies of Bigfoot that is more intelligent and that is, has telepathic capabilities, is able to communicate in very interesting ways with human beings. It's, it's obviously a very, very intelligent creature. Not as intelligent, perhaps, as us, but but certainly more intelligent than a than a gorilla. And that seems there's something interesting going on there. I'm wondering if somebody took this primordial hominid and and did some cross species genetics, did some genetic modification, and 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 upgraded, so to speak, this this bestial hominid into something more remarkable, something with a larger brain, something approximating the intelligence of a human being. Because when you examine these Bigfoot stories and the ones I've read about, the famous accounts, but then also in, in my, my personal investigation, stories that, that I'm tracking here in Montana, for example, you encounter, you, you encounter these sort of two different kinds of Bigfoot. The, the, the one that is, as I said earlier, more primitive and more, more like a smart ape. And then the other one, which is clearly telepathic and able to communicate in very sophisticated ways. And that, that's, that seems to be consistent across the board as it pertains to Bigfoot. Some people, for example, I have a, my friend Mancow, the famous shock jock from Chicago, had a, had a very close encounter with a Bigfoot in Missouri when he was a boy. And it was, and I, and he's talked to me about it in great detail. And he just believes it's a big animal. It's a beast. And he just, and the way he describes it is indeed very bestial. It, it was just like a, a, a large, intelligent gorilla, something like that, but not as, not, not anywhere near as intelligent as a human being, but more intelligent than a gorilla. And it was clearly an animal. And, you know, he was very close to it. But then there's a story I'm tracking here in Montana where some individuals I know are having encounters with a Bigfoot, a male and a female. And this thing is not just an animal. This is an intelligent being that seems to have extraordinary capabilities. So th these two things are always in play. These two, you know, versions of Bigfoot are, are always in play. And some people will attest to the fact this is just a smart ape. And others will say, no, this is something more than just a smart ape. So uh, that, those are my developing thoughts on, on Bigfoot. One thing I think it's really interesting is, too, like you had mentioned, just the two, like you said, versions where it's like some people have these benign accounts where they just see these things. But then you, then you hear other encounters with, with it almost seems like these beings possess a level of intelligence that, that far supersedes anything we could even comprehend. I mean, their stories, I'm sure you're very well aware that their stories dating back many, many years. So many tribes have stories of these things. Uh, people have talked about that you know they 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 bury their dead. They know you're around long before you are even aware they're around. Um, you know, supposedly they're able to cloak. I mean, there's just they have their own language. People mention the samurai chittering. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, and there's also stories where you know that they mention that they're extremely aggressive or they'll they'll communicate in ways that they they almost understand. Um, I don't want to say human interaction, but they understand body language. They understand demeanor. So it's like we're, we're dealing with something that's, that's like you said, very intelligent, far beyond our own comprehension. And so, you know, one thing that me and my dad always, always talked about is biblically, it's pretty much, you know, the rise, fall and, and reclamation of Israel. You know what I mean? Because it's like you have in, in the first bits of Genesis, it's, it's, it's Adam and Eve and pff, it goes all the way. And so you don't really get a lot of context to pre-flood world as much and one of the biggest things that that i always thought about was you know the famous story of cain and abel it's like well why is cain marked 
because you know and the bible says you know to to, to let the others know what do you mean who else is here at this point we just have you know adam and eve and, and it's like what so who's he going out in the wild and, and seeing what else you know what else is going on so um and anyway it's just really fascinating and you, then you tie that back with of course the adam and eve story and it's like it's yeah. just so funny because people take it at face value they don't understand what the words mean and so they just think it's an actual garden or it's not a garden they, excuse me they think it's an actual snake but i'm like no if you look at it it, it, it says shining no i i would i would contend that it's an allegory allegory thank but you. if you're talking about the garden of eden i would contend very strongly that we're dealing with an allegory but uh so people get hung up on the details they get yeah. hung up on the snake and the tree and the, and the nakedness and yep and it 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 becomes uh a literal story to them and, and and people are very they get very upset when i say this but i don't think we're looking at a literal story here we're looking at an allegory clearly to me it's an allegory right of something much more interesting than a garden and a snake and right. naked people uh there's something much more profound going on there um and and of course the biblical narrative employs every kind of figure of speech under the sun including allegories and metaphors and analogies and so forth um but in in regard to Cain yeah it's a very interesting question one that has never been thoroughly in, uh, answered at least to any satisfaction as far as i'm concerned the question regarding who did Cain marry number 1 and number 2 who was he afraid of encountering like you said that that were going to kill him it, it, we're we're dealing with the early generations of Adam and Eve here so all you have are the are the the extended family uh, the the other sons and and daughters of Adam and Eve. So it's Cain's siblings that are populating the world, and his nephews and nieces, um, and so it's 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 the family, it's family members that are populating the world, and and it seems very odd his response when he's marked and banished from the family, his 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 concern is is perplexing. It, it certainly gives you the impression that there's somebody else around besides the family of Adam and Eve. Yep. And I don't know, I, I honestly don't know why this people get so up in arms about this because so what? It doesn't really change the, the, the biblical narrative at all. Right. And, and it, it, it just, and, th and again, the conventional explanation here is that who did Cain marry? He married one of his sisters. And of course, when you are dealing with a pure genetic stock like Adam and Eve, you can engage in that kind of, you can engage in, in, in what we would call today incest. And the reason why incest is, the reason why incest is unadvisable is because of the genetic, um, the genetic disorders that arise when you, when you breed within your family line. Well, that wasn't a problem back then. So, the because you you're you're dealing with the prototypical human beings that they they didn't have as many disorders genetic disorders as we do today if if any so um that really wasn't an issue so people say well he just married one of his sisters or one of his nieces or something like that well that's a very lazy answer as far as i'm concerned i mean certainly it's possible but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you put all the pieces together and he goes off and he begins to build cities and to basically start a civilization. And the question is with whom? So um, there's, there's obviously a whole lot more going on. And if you just take a literal reading of the Old Testament of the, of the book of Genesis, I don't think you walk away with all the pieces. You think you do, you think you do. See, people think that this, that a literal rendering of the, of the book of Genesis is somehow the most accurate and most faithful to the text. According to who? That's the question. According to a modern reader, modern readers, I'm going on a little bit of a rant here, but uh, modern, modern readers and, and, and modern people such as ourselves, we're very much data oriented. Mm -hmm. We're surrounded by data. We live in a scientific society. So we, when we read nonfiction, we want facts. Right. We don't want allegory. We don't want metaphor. We don't want symbolism. We don't have any time for that. We want facts. Right. If it's going to be nonfiction, then we want it in. Then we want a fact-based narrative. And in fact, we can't hardly comprehend anything else. We understand nonfiction and we understand fiction. 
and anything that's not fact-based, data-driven is fiction. Mm -hmm. And these are the only two categories we have in our head. This is not the way that ancient people thought. The, the, the lines between fiction and nonfiction were much more blurry than they are today. There, the, the use of allegory and analogy and metaphor, figures of speech, were intermingled with factual stories in order to convey information. The, the point is the story has to be communicative. That's the point. And you have to figure out what, it's, what the author is attempting to communicate. And in order to rightly understand what's being communicated, you have to understand the symbolism. And it's like, I always use this analogy, so much of the biblical narrative and, and lots of ancient texts are, are like zip, a zip file on a computer. So when you download a zipped file, you don't yet have the information. You have the folder, rather a zip folder. You have the folder and you have it and you can see the name of the folder. You can have an idea of what's inside of it, but you don't really know what the contents are until you unzip it on your computer. And when you unzip it, you can extract the files and then you can go in and see the details of what those files are. And this is very much the way that, that the biblical narrative is written. Some portions of the biblical narrative are written and other ancient texts. They're delivered as a zipped folder that has to be, the contents have to be extracted. And in order to rightly extract those contents, you have to have, you have to have knowledge of the symbolism. You have to have an understanding of the culture. And in this case, the ancient Near East, the Mesopotamian culture and the ancient Egyptians. It's the, it's the same sort of I, I, idea. When you look at the ancient Egyptian mythologies and the symbolisms, and it's the same for the symbolisms and mythologies of ancient Sumer and, and, and the Akkadians, um, you, you're looking at you're looking at encoded information. And who encoded this information? Who was writing back then? Here's another thing we don't understand because we're moderns. Everybody writes today. We all sit here and we send text messages all day long. All of us write. We write in some fashion and we all of us read, right? We're all constantly reading on the internet. We're constantly writing. It's taken for granted that, that we are literate, all of us. There's a very small per percentage of the population of the, of the civilized world that is illiterate. Most of us are literate, at least a very basic degree, right? Let's say a fifth grade level. This is not the case in the ancient world. Writing and reading was an, was an exercise exclusive to the priest class and the, and, the, and the royal bloodlines. This was not something that was broadly distributed. It was, it was governmental positions, gover um, members of the government would be would be adept in reading and writing because they would, you know, for example, in Sumer, they would devise the cylinder seals and so forth. And, and transactions were made um, using various forms of, of writing and in order, in order to, to take censuses and, 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 and to validate transactions and so forth. Um, but, but the general populace was not engaged in this kind of learning. The wise, what, what the learned did, what the sages did, is they packaged stories, they created stories in which they embedded important information. And, this, and, the, and the general populace, and sometimes they're referred to as the profane by the wise, and I'm talking about an ancient context, the general populace were, were profane. Profane meaning that they were not initiated into the mysteries, into the symbolism, into the understanding. They were the lay people. They were not the royal class or the priest class, and, or they were not part of the governmental apparatus that needed to know how to read and write and, 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 and to understand and interpret the symbol, symbolism. So the, the, the stories, the mythologies were packaged in a way that, the, that it could communicate to the profane, to the masses, but yet also encode very important information for the sagacious, for the wise, for the sage class. And those stories were passed down through time and preserved in this manner so that the lay person would receive the mythology and, and it would be a fairy tale, a bedtime story. They would tell the mythologies. They would talk about, you know, if it's the Sumerian mythology of the flood, for example, and Enki and, and, and the whole affair and in the Egyptian mythologies with, with Ra and, and with Isis and Osiris and Set and all of these characters that we're so familiar with from ancient 
Egyptian, from the ancient Egyptian pantheon. And the same thing with the Greeks and the Romans and so on. So the people would receive these stories and they would receive them at face value. So they were getting like a zipped folder and they would know nothing of the contents. They would just know, they would just have it at face value. The gods exist. These are who the gods are. These, this is the stories that unfolded. So they would, the general pub public would be very, very knowledgeable about the fairy tales, but they would not understand the encoded information that's embedded within them would be unpacked by those who were initiated. So they could take those stories, unpack them, and derive uh, functional information from them. This, this is something that Isaac Newton figured out. Isaac Newton would read some of the Roman and Egyptian, uh, rather Roman and Greek mythologies. And he realized that, that embedded within these mythologies is practical information related to alchemy. And people, of course, you know, scientists today roll their eyes at Isaac Newton for his experiments in alchemy, but they always overlook the fact that he was right. So there was a particular story, mythology involving the god Vulcan in Greek mythology, and I don't re recall what it was exactly, but it was involving the god Vulcan and some other characters. And Isaac Newton realized that all of these gods stood for like different kinds of chemicals or metals, or I forget exactly what it was. And he believed that if he unraveled this particular, based on the characters in the story and what they represented, if he unraveled the story and derived the scientific information from it, then he could, through, through processes of alchemy that he was experimenting with, he could derive what's sometimes called the net. There's this, this, this um, substance that you could create through uh, alchemical processes. And it's very detailed. I don't have all the details here in front of me, but, it's all good. but the point is that, that Newton took this story involving Vulcan and other gods Roman, in the Roman pantheon. He took the story apart. He understood the symbolism and, and he ran the experiment and was literally able to create this material that is sometimes referred to as, as, as the net, this material. He was able to, to through alchemic processes, uh, derive this material. It succeeded. Now, that's a very sloppy uh, explanation. I didn't think I was going to be talking about Isaac Newton this morning, but <laughs> that's a very sloppy explanation of what he did. But you can go, the, your listeners can go and research this, and, yeah. and, and, and re you'll realize it's true. So Isaac Newton obviously was a brilliant guy, one of the, one of the foremost, if not the foremost scientists uh, that we've ever had in the scientific age. And he looked at the mythologies. He was, he was, you know, initiated, so to speak. He was, he was a very wise man. And he understood that, that there was something practical. There was practical scientific knowledge embedded within this myth. And so the point is that, uh, the Bible does the same thing in many ways. This is with the nature of prophecy, by the way, the, the nature of prophecy is it's intentionally non-literal when when a prophet is 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 receiving information because that's what it is when you read in the biblical narrative you read about the various prophets and the kind of information that's being conveyed to them when they're receiving this information it's a communication and it's usually happening within the context of a visionary experience so either a dream or a vision mostly right. dream by the way, predominantly dreams, but sometimes a trance-like state, a vision. So the prophets aren't going anywhere. They're not actually seeing, in most cases, they're not actually seeing anything in reality. What they're getting is a communication. They're getting a download of information, and it's a perceptual experience. And this information is being conveyed to them through symbolism. So they're getting zipped folders downloaded into their brain and they're conveying those zipped folders through time so that the wise later on can extract the information. The Bible does this all the time. Uh, it is the nature of prophecy. Prophecy by nature is esoteric. So in the book of Revelation, for example, this happens. John, of course, is having a visionary experience. He's on the island of Patmos and he's, he's quote unquote, in the spirit on the Lord's Day on the island of Patmos, and he's having a visionary experience. And, and in this experience, he's, he's through this perceptual and um, virtual reality situation, he's perceiving and he's seeing all of this symbolic stuff. And, and he says so various times. For example, 
he gives the number of the number of the beast, which is a number of a man, six. But it's three times six, 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 right? So it's six times six times six. That's the number of the beast. It's the number of a man, right? Rather, it's the number of a man three times, not six times. So it's the number of a man is six three times, right? So it's six times six times six, which happens to be a processional number. But we don't have to talk about that right now. But the point is, what does John say in Revelation? Calculate the number of the beast, right? Those who are wise calculate the number of the beast, or something to that effect. So it's and I and I remember reading that when I was a young man, thinking, "Why don't you just tell me what it means? <laughs> Why should I have to sit here and figure it out?" Right. And and I would feel that way when I would read the Book of Daniel, and I would and I would just be you know befuddled, thinking, "Why is this not just plainly spoken?" Indeed, the the disciples of Christ expressed the same befuddlement with Jesus on on several occasions because. There's several occasions in which they say Jesus will say something plain to them, and they say, ah, now you're speaking plainly to us. Finally, yes, yes. we can understand what you're saying, because he would speak to them in parables and yep. riddles, metaphor, figures of speech, allegories. What do you think a parable is? It's an allegory, is it not? Yeah. So, so the Son of God, who knows everything, through whom all of creation was came into existence, is walking on the earth among human beings among us mortals and how does he speak to us allegory well he speaks to us through allegory allegory parables that's what a parable is he doesn't he rarely speaks plainly to his disciples rarely because of the occasions where they're like oh finally you're saying something we can understand he's mostly speaking in parables and allegory figures of speech metaphors analogies so if this is the way the Son of God is communicating to us when he's actually on the earth, walking among us, then we should assume that this is the modus operandi of the Old Testament, right? Including the book of Genesis. So it's, it's natural then to assume that much of what we're reading uh, in, in Genesis in the beginning, in the garden, is in fact allegorical. And that does not mean that it's not true by any stretch of the imagination and this is again this is going back to the way that that the the ancients had a different approach to data to information than we do today we cannot think we cannot read ancient texts including the book of enoch and the dead sea scrolls and other ancient texts um mesopotamian and, and ancient egyptian texts we cannot read them like modern people and think that we are going to understand them because they won't make much sense they'll seem like a bunch of dummies who believed in fantastical things that were obviously untrue now that may be the case with the masses but it was not the case with with the sage class and with the royal bloodlines and this is apparent also even further in time when you're dealing with for example civilizations like the inca in south america the Inca had the, the royal class, and indeed, the term Inca, we're getting far afield here, but the term Inca does not refer to all of the indigenous people of the Andes Mountains who were subjugated by this empire. Rather, Inca only referred to the royal bloodline, the royal family. Only they were Inca. The Spanish called them orejones because they had those big discs in their ear in their earlobes. Orejones means big ears, right? So... Uh, only the, the that bloodline was the Inca, not the rest of the the rest of the tribes, the rest of the indigenous communities were subjugated to that that exclusive group of people who look, by the way, a little different than the rest of the natives because there's there's portraits, for example, of Atahualpa, who was the Sapa Inca, the 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 Incan emperor, when. Pizarro arrived with the conquistadors, and uh, Atahualpa in some of these depictions has a mustache and fair skin. So there's there's something different. The Inca were described as being taller and fairer skin, and they were. And this is not a racial commentary. This is just what the the chroniclers described. And they subjugated the other indigenous tribes, but only they were the Inca. And why do I bring up the Inca? Because the Inca had a policy. There was a, there was the priest class. There were the the grandes almaltas, who were the great teachers of the Inca. These this was these were the sages among the Inca, the, the grandes almaltas, and they 
were the teachers of the of the royal bloodline. So only the priest class and the royal class had the information, had the actual information. They were the keepers of the knowledge. The rest of the empire, the rest of the of the citizens of the empire were profane. They were not initiated. And so the Inca had their they had their form of record keeping and and which was called quipus which was a system of ropes and knots that only they understood the, the the royal class and the priest class and the royal class also encompassed the administrative class so you have the the, the royal slash administrative class and the priest class that have all the knowledge and and they can interpret it and they can understand it but the lay people were given a basic understanding and and in to some in some regard a false understanding of the symbolism, but just enough to keep them subjugated and pacified and and uh, loyal to the government and 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 to um, and to the religion, right? So the same thing happens in modern masonry. The Freemasons do the same thing. So we know Manly P. Hall, who is the greatest philosopher among the Freemasons and and scholar. Manly P. Hall says that in his writings that the the lower levels of freemasonry so working up through the blue lodge before you get inducted into the into the york or scottish right those levels which is probably between the first and 33rd degree they are literally given a different explanation for the meaning of the symbolism and they they think they understand what the symbols mean but they don't you're not really initiated into the meaning of the symbolism until you've you become a member of the Scottish or York Rite and you reach the 33rd degree. Then you're told what that actually means. But they're given enough information to keep the, the order, an environment in which the those who are, who, who are Freemasons are initiated into some level of the mysteries, but a level at which they can appreciate the, the mysteries, that they can feel like they've been informed of something secret and are a part of this fraternity that is that is that is harboring information that the general populace doesn't have so they have enough of that to keep them in the organization but but it's not the true meaning of the symbolism you don't understand what the symbols actually mean until you're initiated at the higher degrees so and, and this is by the way the free this is the tradition that the freemasons are carrying on from the ancient world and so when we read ancient scripts whether it be the biblical texts or the Dead Sea Scrolls or ancient Egyptian um, text or or cuneiform Sumerian text or Akkadian text or, or what have you, this is the modus operandi. This is the way the ancient world was. This is the way that the communication in the ancient world happened. It was It was for the wise. You had a profane, you had a level of information for the profane, and then you had an unpacking of that information from which functional technology, functional knowledge can be derived. That was the, the exercise of the wise. And, that, and so that's, that's a very long explanation of why I think it's a mistake to approach these ancient writings, especially the Bible, from a purely literalistic in, interpretive uh, hermeneutic. What exactly are the supernatural cryptids that all these people are encountering pertaining to the entities that a lot of people see that that generally you know feed off fear that are that are, seem clearly demonic in nature so what exactly are, are these demons like what, what are and i'm not talking about like just bigfoot but like dogman mothman um you know the people talk about seeing like you know mantis beings just all these horrific beings what, what exactly are they and then why why do they have this whole agenda where they talk about like as if they're another race from another galaxy or something like that, like they're aliens or something. I'm sorry, it's well, we kind of to, ambiguous, but I kind of want to let, let you run with it. Well, we have to parse, we have to get in here and, 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 and parse the particular characters we're talking about. Because let's, let's take, for example, let's take, for example, gray aliens and just set them to the side. Because I think that's a completely different topic. And, and, and we'll discuss rather like Dogman, Bigfoot, paranormal type activity. I'm not, I don't embrace the term supernatural because I, it's, number one, it's not a biblical term. I don't mind if people use it. I understand what it means, but it's, I don't personally use it because it's not, it's not, it doesn't mean anything. It has no explanatory power. 
Uh, I do like the term paranormal because that means something that's an exception to our normal, our normal everyday experiences. It's, it's something extraordinary that happens outside of the current under, our current understanding of, of the world. That would be paranormal. So it's something exceptional happens. Something exceptional happens that we can't explain. We can call that paranormal because we simply don't understand the mechanisms behind what's happening. Supernatural is a it's a different term. It, it's it's derived from from the Latin word supernaturalis, which means above or beyond nature. So supernatural, whereas paranormal means something that's simply outside of our normal experience and understanding supernatural means something that defies or breaks the laws of nature because the, the term means beyond or above nature so now we're dealing with when we use the term supernatural we're dealing with um a ph phenomena that are outside of the bounds of the laws of physics are 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 outside of the limitations of the physical universe and so those are two different concepts. And I don't believe, I, I don't subscribe to a supernatural perspective of the universe. Um, I think there's only two supernatural beings in the universe, and that would be the father and his son, his only begotten son. Uh, everything else exists within the framework, within the confines of the laws of physics, the, the, and we don't understand all of those laws, but there's an order implicit in the universe and everything is constrained by that order. So that is a, that is a distinctly non-supernatural perspective of the universe, but within this universe, there is a whole lot of paranormal activity. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, but, yeah. So I set aside, and I'm not telling you not to use it. I'm just, uh, yeah. um, as, if we're going to broach this topic, I want people to understand where I'm coming from. So I set aside the word, I more than set aside, I I disabuse myself of this supernatural worldview because it has no explanatory power. Because when you say, someone says, well, that was a, something supernatural just happened, you're, you didn't say anything. All you're saying is something extraordinary just happened. Um so, but if you say something paranormal just happened, then you're acknowledging there's something beyond my normal perception, my normal everyday ex experience with reality that just happened. That's within the realms of being able to understand it should you uncover the mechanisms behind what happened. Okay, that's, a, that's just something I like to clarify sometimes because it, it, I think it helps people understand the way that I'm thinking about these things. So, and the reason why I bring this up is because you asked me, when you talk about dog man, and Bigfoot and paranormal activity in general, there's, there are places where all of these things happen. And one of those places is Skinwalker Ranch. Mm. And so Skinwalker Ranch is a great case study for the paranormal, right? And you have within, in this geographical area, not just on Skinwalker Ranch, in that area, you have a suite of paranormal phenomena that, that is happening rather routinely. Going into this conversation with Eric, I had a I'd never been to the ranch, but I've read the book, you know, by Kel Kella Heller and Knapp, The Hunt for the Skinwalker, and was and, and I'm very intrigued with Skinwalker Ranch in general, the topic in general, and am very much familiar with the goings on on the ranch. Um, you know what what happened with the um, with the with the with the family that owned the ranch, and then with Bigelow's group, and then now with. Um, with uh geez i just forgot his name the the current owner of the ranch i, I it's i drew a blank on it the reason why i'm so fascinated with the ranch is because as i said earlier it encompasses all of this paranormal activity and i and i i after reading the book and interfacing with george knapp and um i had the opportunity to talk to george at a conference uh that uh i invited him to speak at a, a conference we did in the past and to ask him some questions about the ranch and so I'm always very interested in people's perspective. What do they think is happening there? People who've been there and who've done investigations such as George. And I often get a very interesting response from these people because, and, and this is the, the, the theory that I'm, that I'm formulating, there seems to be something 
I was going to say in the vicinity of the ranch, but I, I think it's more accurate to say beneath the ranch, that is affecting human perception. And and I don't have, you know, this is a this is a very long, this is a very deep topic that I'm not going to go into all the details of why I think that. But I have had the suspicion that something is affecting human perception. You have phenomena there that's unfolding that is physical and and is actually happening in real time. A lot of the UFO sightings, even portals, cattle mutilations, these are things that are physically happening, tangible. Animals, for example, cows being mysteriously transported from the corral into a into a container, for example, or a what, what, what would you call it? A um, there's cattle in a corral that was suddenly and inexplic- inexplicably transferred into a what's the word I'm looking for here? It's not a container. It's a um, oh my god, my brain is not firing on all cylinders. <laughs> this morning. Um, uh, but anyway, into a very small confined space where the doors are, were, were closed and locked. So you have stuff like that. It's like a, a like a camper almost. I can't think of the terminology, but uh, you have you have phenomena like that that's very physical and tangible and and inexplicable, really. So there's a lot of that that's going on out there. But at the same time, there's other things that are not necessarily happening within happening in real time or within or uh, as a part of the fabric of reality. Rather, much of the activity I have hypothesized is happening as a virtual reality scenario being played out within, inside of your own perception. So in other words, people who go there are having their perception manipulated. And so they're seeing and sometimes collectively seeing things that are not actually there. The reason why I've been formulating this particular hypothesis is because it began when I was reading Carla Turner's, Dr. Carla Turner's work on uh, alien abduction. And she, she talks about a feature of the abduction phenomenon that is very little considered uh, when people talk about abductions. And that is what she called VRSs, virtual reality scenarios, that apparently the beings that are abducting people are able to generate these virtual reality scenarios so that you can have five people in a room and only one of them is engaging with this alternate reality that is a perceptual experience. So in other words, a trance or a vision. And and they're seeing things that no one else is seeing, or sometimes everyone collectively is seeing something that isn't actually there. Um, That is quite common within the abduction phenomenon. And so I sort of extrapolated this out to some of the activity that's happening on the ranch. And I wondered if these same sort of virtual reality scenarios are not also playing out uh, in some of the encounters that people have on the ranch. Are they actually encountering, in some cases, are they actually encountering what they think they're seeing in real time? Or are they having a perceptual experience, a virtual reality experience that is indistinguishable from reality. And if that's true, if that's the case, then it it answers a lot of questions. There's a lot of explanatory power. If you have a if you have a faction, if you have beings with the capability to manipulate or control human perception, it can explain a lot. Anyway, I went into this conversation with with Eric Bard with this hypothesis in mind, and, and we were interfacing about something particular. I asked him about his, his, what was his opinion in regard to the variegated paranormal activity and episodes that have been documented on the ranch. But after he told me some details in some of his thoughts, he said, you know what, I've got this theory that I'm developing. He said, I, I have a feeling he said, I can't prove it, but I have a feeling that something is manipulating our perception on the ranch. And when he said that, obviously, I was very interested because this was my own hypothesis. And to hear this eminent scientist who's actively studying the ranch, I mean, he's got that, he's got cameras 
pointed at all angles on this thing and all kinds of, if you've seen the TV show, you know, Eric has a, just a, just a top notch scientific investigation underway or him and his team. And, um, I was very intrigued to hear this, to, to, to hear that he also had drawn the same conclusions as me. There's, there's something manipulating perception on that ranch. So again, you have two categories of activity here. You have activity that's happening in real time in, within the confines of reality. In other words, it's tangible, it's actually happening. And then you have experiences which are subjective to the viewer, experiences which are happening in a virtual reality scenario through the manip manipulation of your perception. And that encompasses some of the activity that's happening at Skinwalker and other places in the world. So much of what we call paranormal, I think falls within this virtual reality environment in which we're perceiving something that may not actually be there. It's real to us because it's hijacking all of our perceptual faculties. But in the space of reality, it's not actually there. And, and again, I would say that much of what we describe as paranormal falls within this category. And when you take these two concepts and you blend them together, let's say, for example, we're dealing with a highly advanced, in some cases at Skinwalker Ranch, I am certainly of the opinion that, that this is the case. We're dealing with a highly advanced non-human faction that probably, in my estimation, has a base under that ranch. Whoa. Or in the vicinity of that ranch and are deploying technology constantly to generate Einstein Rosen bridges and so forth. So that, and they're moving. It's a point of, you have these beings coming and going. It's a point of, of entry and, and exiting in and out of this atmosphere because there's a base there. I, that was a very sloppy way of saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm reaching for words here this morning that my brain, is not, <laughs> okay. my brain is not giving me the words that I want. And I can see the owner of Skinwalker Ranch's face in my head right now, but I can't, I can't get his name. <laughs> it's like a docking bay almost. This is the best way that I, because I'm not getting the words I want to use here. It's like a docking bay. It's like a docking bay or a harbor for craft because they're coming in and out and they're coming back to the base, right? This is what I'm trying to communicate. And so there's constantly portals being generated there. So, the, so what I'm trying to say is because there's, craft incoming and outgoing from this base you have the generation of of einstein rosen bridges happening wherever they're happening in the atmosphere perhaps even under the ground and that would in and of itself create a, an environment in which there's some very interesting magnetic anomalies and electromagnetic anomalies and things like this constantly occurring because of the properties involved in the generation of that, the mechanisms involved in the generation of, of, a, of a portal. And I know people think that, you know, portals just within the realm of sci-fi. I assure you it's not. So if, if I'm correct, and this is incoming and outgoing constantly because there's a base. And by the way, I should, I should say that I had a conversation with uh, the late Kevin Burns, who was the president of Prometheus Entertainment. And Prometheus Entertainment produces that show. And, and they do a very fine job at it. Kevin and I were acquaintances, and 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 Kevin called me, uh, but actually while he was developing the show, he died, you know, a, a few a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Uh, but but I had the opportunity to talk to Kevin about Skinwalker Ranch because you know he, he, we were talking about the production of the show and some things about Skinwalker Ranch which were relevant to me, and. And some things Kevin wanted me to do in relation to the show. And, and I asked Kevin, actually, Kevin asked me what my thoughts were about the ranch. And I told him that I think there's an alien base under there. And he just was astounded. He was astounded because he said, Tim, that is exactly what I think. He said, now, some of my colleagues think I'm crazy. He said, but Tim, I've... I've interfaced with everyone at the ranch and I've been putting this show together. He's like, I am absolutely convinced there's an alien based under that ranch. Wow. And, and so it's, it's just interesting to me that, you know, that Kevin would have drawn the same conclusion as me 
having hands-on experience with the investigation and with the production of the TV show. And this is, of course, not something that you're going to hear Travis Taylor espouse, and certainly not Eric Bard, um, because it's it's just highly speculative. That's all it is. I don't have any, I mean, aside from all the, the phenomena that's occurring there, I don't have any, I don't have any proof, obviously, any evidence that can definitively point to the existence of an alien base beneath Skinwalker Ranch, but that's my hypothesis. And so I think that the, the manipulation of the perceptual manipulation that's taking place there is to conceal the existence of the base and is to, um, is to confuse us in regard to what's actually happening there. So when you throw in a bunch of perceptual, quote unquote, paranormal activity in, in the mix with actual scientific uh, phenomena that's unfolding, like the generation of a portal, the coming and going of, of UFO craft, the electromagnetic radiation, all of these scientific, very scientific phenomena happening, and you jumble in a bunch of weird paranormal stuff, you know, gigantic wolves, bulletproof wolves, and paranormal activity, uh, poltergeist activity, where, you know, uh, your typical ghost type stuff happening. And, and when you jumble all that together, what it does is it creates an environment in which it's almost impossible to get to the bottom of what's actually happening, to discover, to uncover the reality, literally in this case, beneath the ranch. So it's a, it's a tactic, I think, that's being used to scramble the investigative efforts, to confound the investigative efforts. And there's enough knowledge of, of, of the human psyche and even of, I would say, um, even of, to some extent, our understanding of or our conceptualization of the paranormal to mix in all of this other stuff to keep us guessing. And um, when, in, when in reality, behind the scenes, there's something very techn technological happening that is being concealed. And they're doing a really, if this, if I'm right, if I'm right in this, hypothesis of mine, these entities are doing a really good job at concealing their, um, their operation beneath that ranch. And so when we broach this topic of the paranormal and we talk about Dogman and Bigfoot, as I mentioned earlier, the big, the, certain varieties of the Bigfoot are clearly telepathic, clearly. Um, if you have let's assume for the sake of argument that there is a variety of Bigfoot that is exceedingly telepathic. Let's even take that word. Let's apply a different word that encompasses telepathy. Let's say they have extraordinary psychic capabilities. When I say psychic, we're going to encompass, we're going to encompass various capabilities that would fall within this terminology of, of psychic, right? Including telepathy, but not limited to telepathy. If you can communicate words into someone else's brain, because that's not really what's happening with telepathy. What's happening is ideas are being communicated, images, pictures. When a gray alien speaks to a, communicates with an abductee, they don't do it with words. It's always telepathic in an abduction scenario. When this happens, the communication is not in your language. This, I think this is a, mis, this is a misconception. It's not, you're not being communicated to in a language. You're being communicated to through brain waves. So the thoughts of, if I'm communicating with you telepathically, it's not words. See, the, the modulation of the voice, the articulation of words is a very slow way to communicate. Yep. You have to formulate sentences, right? And those sentences have to make sense and they have to be relevant to you. So we have to be speaking the same language to begin with. And then the words that we're formulating have to make sense to you. So we have to use our adjectives and our verbs and the proper um, structure of language in English to communicate. And that takes time. It's a computation that happens in my brain. And then it's a computation that's happening in your brain right now that's interpreting what I'm saying. Right. That's a very slow, primitive way to communicate. A much faster way, a much more advanced way of communication is to communicate my thoughts directly into your brain. 
without without the need for vocalization or for modulation of to create words and sentences without the need to speak in a, in a language with all of the rules that come along with that there's no formulation of sentences here when you're having a telepathic communication it's instantaneous it's communication at the speed of thought now even though i'm communicating my thoughts with my mouth verbally vocally it's still my thoughts are faster than my tongue right it takes me time to take my thoughts and formulate the words and then modulate with my vocal cords and then those words to come out of my mouth in some meaningful way and reach your ears and then be interpreted by your brain it's very it's it seems like it's a very fast process right because here we are having this conversation but it's clumsy i'm reaching for words i'm not finding names faces but if you and I were communicating telepathically, you would instantly know who I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about somebody because you'd see their face in your head just as I do. You following me? Yep. So this kind of communication, this psychic communication, telepathic and otherwise, is much more advanced and it's much more expedient and useful than, than the vocalization of words. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a form of communication that conveys not only, it's almost like Wi-Fi. It conveys not only it doesn't convey sounds necessarily. It conveys images. It conveys brain activity, right? It's like a it's like a, a my brain waves are broadcasting into yours, and so it's much more efficient, and and it's and and therefore I can if I'm communicating telepathically with you, I can communicate imagery. That's a very important thing to understand. So if you have the ability to, for telepathy within this psychic suite, you have the ability for telepathy, might you also have the ability to manipulate the perception of the person you're communicating with? Might you have the ability to hijack the perception so that the brain is confused about what the eyeballs are seeing? Now, People might be wondering, well, why would, why would you assume that? Have you ever put on a virtual reality headset? I mean, when you do that, you're not interfacing with things that are actually there, but your brain thinks you are. So it's, it's, you know that you have a headset on, but you can be so engrossed in that reality that for a while you forget that it's not actually there. And, and really good virtual reality can do this and increasingly will do this. You will, it will be indistinguishable. Reality and virtual reality at some point is going to become indistinguishable through technology. That's, that's a given, okay? That's, that's going to happen. And that's a whole other conversation, but that's going to happen. So what if certain beings are able to have such powerful psychic capabilities, telepathic and otherwise, that in the same way you put on a headset, and through technology, you can see a world that's not really there. What if they can hijack your perception the same way, either through technology or through an innate psychic ability to do so? Because if you can transfer brain waves, right? If you can if you can broadcast brain waves, and the person you're communicating with can understand what you're thinking and seeing, then it isn't a, it isn't that far of a leap then to also extrapolate a scenario in which they can fool your brain into thinking your eyeballs are seeing something that's not there. Why do I say that? Because Bigfoot, there are, there are plenty of cases in which someone will have a face-to-face -face encounter with a Bigfoot. The Bigfoot will communicate telepathically and then vanish or turn around, start walking away and vanish. Um, and so it's assumed that the Bigfoot has super natural capabilities. Well, again, the word supernatural has no explanatory power. It doesn't mean anything. It's magic. So I push it off the table. That's not an option for me. There's something happening here. Is the Bigfoot actually dematerializing or is it engaging your perception to cloak itself from you? Mm, never thought of it that way. Which I think is much more plausible because it already communicated telepathically with you. So it's already plugged in, right? It's already engaging your brain through brain waves. So if it turns around and decides it doesn't want you to see it anymore, 
it can, I think, can fool your, your brain into perceiving something, hijacking your perception momentarily. So you think it vanished when in reality, it just walked into the woods. And this is a cloaking device, so to speak. It's a, um, you can even just, you can even think of it as a defense mechanism, like an animal in the wild, a, um, let's say a chameleon, for example, it doesn't want to be seen. And so it, it's able to change the, the color tones of its skin in order to conceal itself from you. It didn't go anywhere. It's still there. But you know, our perception, our vision is a little better than, 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 some of the, than some of the predators that are trying to eat it in some aspects because our brains can differentiate the outline of the chameleon probably better than, let's say, a snake. And so that chameleon effectively disappears. Does it not? It effectively disappears in front of that snake. Yeah. And it's gone. And as far as the snake, if this as far as the snake is concerned, <laughs> imagining a snake that is, you know, has the intelligence of a human being, <laughs> something supernatural just happened. Or something paranormal just occurred. It was about to strike this lizard and it disappeared. But we know that it didn't disappear. We know it just cloaked itself using this capability it has to change the color of its skin. So from the snake's per perception, or maybe a snake's not a great example because the snake is using its tongue to, you know, to taste the lizard rather than see it. So maybe it's not the, be the best example. But from the predator's perspective, the chameleon disappeared. And so that's a very crude example. But, but if, you, if we extrapolate this out to the Bigfoot, it's using the same kind of defense mechanism, but it's doing so by engaging telepathically with us, cloaking itself from our perspective. It's like when, you know, it's something like when, you know, you're pursuing, let's say there's a, there's a Russian fighter jet pursuing a, an American fighter jet and the American fighter jet deploys flares, deploys flares. So that when this jet pursuing it fires its missiles that are heat seeking, they go after the flares instead of the jet. The jet has effectively cloaked itself behind these flares to confuse the missile. And that is what I'm trying to describe. So some of these entities have the ability to cloak themselves, to scramble our perception so that we can't track them anymore. They're gone. This is, of course, speculation. And uh, it, it, it may or may not be true, but I am convinced that something like this is happening with some of these entities, with some of these creatures, and that this explains a lot of the so-called paranormal activity that, that people encounter, even as it relates to ghosts and things like this. Um, and I think that we, we, we barely understand human consciousness, let alone right. the capabilities of the human brain. Now, I know we can receive telepathic communications. I know, for example, that we can. We there's a there's a there's a a young man. I think he's a paraplegic. Who's controlling a computer screen with his brain through Neuralink, right now, and all he's got to do is think. He can play chess. I forget the name of this young man, but he's the first human patient, the um, human subject of that is testing the Neuralink device, which has been implanted in his brain. But that piece of hardware is interfacing with his brain. It's communicating with his brain so that this young man has the extraordinary capability, which none of us have, to look at a computer screen and play chess and move the pieces without using anything but his mind, okay? So these concepts are real. They're real. In this case, it's a, it's a piece of tech hardware, technology that's allowing him to do it. But what if there are beings, and perhaps we are such beings, but we've lost the capability for this through degeneration, genetic degeneration. What if there are beings in the universe who can do this simply by plugging into your brain telepathically and have these innate psychic capabilities where they can actually manipulate what your eyeballs what your brain thinks your eyeballs are seeing when in reality your eyeballs aren't really seeing this thing but your brain thinks it is they are just like virtual reality 
Wow. So, so that if and no one really factors this in, okay, Eric Bard does. So plug that in to Skinwalker Ranch, plug that into Bigfoot, plug that into some of these paranormal things, and you have a whole new level of analysis. That's amazing. I never even thought of that. And I think that it's a much better, see, supernatural has no explanatory power. But what I'm trying to, to give us here is a framework that does. Right. So let's. So I'm trying to navigate people away from the fairy tale world and into something that's a little bit more tangible and scientific, or at least comprehensible. Sure. And it and it really it's a working theory. I'm not saying it's true. I have no idea, but it's a working theory. And there's no, as I said earlier, there's no question that the Greys communicate telepathically with abductees. They don't speak. They don't vocalize. They don't modulate their words through their. They don't have vocal cords. Right. Okay, so this kind of community, and by the way, I think that telepathic communication was the primary mode of communication of the human species. Going back to Adam. Wow. To the beginning, to the progenitors of our race were operating in this higher mode of communication, which is instantaneous, much more efficient, much more efficient than the modulation of sounds produced by the vibrating of your vocal cords. This is, this is communication at the speed of thought. Yep. And, and imagine, imagine how quickly science would advance if scientists could communicate at the speed of thought. We'd be hundreds of years ahead, if and not now more. Apply that up to the to the grace. Apply yeah. that to the other potential races that exist in the universe who are communicating at the speed of thought and it kind of explains why they're so advanced and why we're still putting around with 20th century technology for the most part so um i think that all of this is very plausible you know you and i you know i, I i'm not going to go down this i was going to go dive into a whole another theme here that connects we don't need to we don't need to tread that rabbit trail right now but but i was just I was just going to highlight the obvious factor that you and I are communicating verbally. We there's an audible communication and visually. Yeah. You're not in my you're not in this room with me. Right. This is an entirely perceptual experience we're having. You're not here. But yet I see you and I hear you through the agency of technology. Why couldn't these why couldn't some of this sort of thing be happening out in the world that we're calling paranormal, but in a different way? Yes, in some cases through technology, but also through the innate capabilities of non-human entities. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's very possible, especially since we know virtually nothing about technology of any other species. Or human consciousness. Yeah. Or the, the capabilities thereof. I think human consciousness is much more potent and extraordinary than we think. See, we live in a very materialistic scientific civilization. And so consciousness is just a product of the brain. It right. can't be. That's impossible. It's impossible that consciousness is just the product of the brain. The brain is an interface between the body and something else. But consciousness is a one of the most extraordinary mysteries that we have. We don't understand human consciousness. And it's in play in all of these experiences. Something about human consciousness, there's something in our consciousness that can interact with the consciousness of other beings. It can broadcast and receive information. And that information is not limited to what's seen out of the eyeballs or heard with the ears. You know, it's not limited to the visual spectrum of light that's taken into our, to our eyes or the vibrational, the, aud the audible vibrations that are interpreted by our brain that are taken in through our ears. There's another layer of communication here that goes beyond physical biology that is more that interfaces with consciousness as well. And that's a whole nother conversation. But, and of course, anyone who's ever 
indulged in magic mushrooms, I think, understands exactly what I'm saying. And I have not, by the way, but, but I'm sure many people listening have and can attest that there is certainly a world of communication, a visual, a, a visual circus of color and light and shape and sound and interaction with the human brain that is outside of our normal experience. I mean, yeah, it, it, you, know, you talk about people, even, you know, ayahuasca experiences. And I know many cultures all throughout the world have their own, um, I don't want to just boil it down to a, a, a hallucinogenic experience because to these people, like it's a whole spiritual thing. I mean, they they go somewhere else. I mean, even dilemethotryptamine, the chemical born or that's produced when you're born right before you die in large amounts, you know, if they... There, there's speculation that, that that is solely responsible for what many people explain as a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience. I mean, uh, again, that ties back to the, the human consciousness, how, there, how there's just so many things that I, I, I really... The problem, the problem is when you have a group of people taking ayahuasca, and I've never done so, but you have a group of people taking ayahuasca, and they have a collective perceptual experience. How do you explain that? How do you explain a half a dozen people sitting in the circle seeing the same thing? Seeing, for example, the same shapes and colors or the same character, entity that steps into their midst and is communicating with them. They all see it together. Right. That happens sometimes. So that's telling me that we're plugging into, we don't have to go down this, again, we don't have to go right, down this right. path. That tells me that we are plugging into an internet of consciousness. Yeah, it's, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, that that it it, it opens you up to a, another another door or opens that doorway. I mean, people mention Another method eye, of but... communication. And so why why is this relevant to our, when you asked me about this, you, right. see, you didn't realize what kind of can of worms you're opening there. When you asked <laughs> me about the Bigfoot and the Dogman and all that, because you take everything I just said, the technological aspects, the psychological aspects, and now this internet of consciousness idea where there's another level of communication that's possible. Take all of that and plug it in to the phenomena, right? And so you've got something, you've got something a little bit, I think, I think it's adding resolution and it's, it's allowing us to con conceptualize things that are simply not available if we just use this term supernatural to just to sort of broadly paint over everything oh that's just supernatural that's just some sort of a supernatural occurrence but it doesn't open up inquiry into what might actually be happening um and so i'm very intrigued as you can tell with like i i would like nothing more than to stand in front of a bigfoot and and see what happens so um and I like, I think that's very unlikely that that will ever happen to me, but, um, but I certainly would pursue such an experience because I'm absolutely intrigued with these creatures. And, you know, I don't think summing up that the Bigfoot has anything necessarily to do with Nephilim. I think it's something else. I think it's a very ancient primordial creature that is not as intelligent as we are, but is certainly more intelligent than an ape. So I just summed up my Bigfoot thought there. With everything we discussed, with everything you and I both know about, I don't want to just boil this down to just cryptids, but I guess you can say just the paranormal in general. Why is it so hard to, I don't want to just say get photographic evidence, but why is it so hard, I'm trying to think how I want to articulate, to articulate this question, we know that in modern science, in order to prove something, you have to be able to replicate it in a controlled environment. Obviously, the paranormal goes beyond our realm of physics. So with that, why is it so hard to get any great photo slash video evidence of just the paranormal in general? Um, well, it would make a whole lot of sense if... What you're trying to get on camera, what you're trying to record is happening in your brain, not in reality. That would answer a whole lot of questions, wouldn't it? I mean, if you're taking a camcorder and you're trying to record something that you're not actually seeing, that you're perceiving, how do you record what you're perceiving? You know, with a, 
with a with a piece of technology. You don't, unless that technology is embedded into your brain somehow. Right. You're you're not recording what you're seeing. You think you're record. You think something's there when it's not, and that's why you can't record it. You're hearing something, and you try to record what you're hearing, but it's not showing up on the device because it's happening in a perceptual environment. So that's one explanation. It's not the only explanation, but it's one. Um, and the other thing is, you know, in, in regard to like, let's say like, let's, let's return to Bigfoot in regard to, to Bigfoot, you know, I, I have a feeling that these, that the animals, especially highly intelligent animals like the Sasquatch can detect electromagnetic fields yes, and avoid them. So if there's an if there's a device like a phone or a modern camera in the environment, it, it's like a dog whistle. We we don't we can't detect it without technology, but but maybe they can. Maybe it's glaringly obvious that that device is present, and the Bigfoot is smart enough for whatever reason to want to avoid it and to understand that that indicates the presence of human beings, and it would rather not be seen or heard by human beings. It would rather not, it's just like a, a, a grizzly bear, right? So uh, I think that those are two explanations that could solve a lot of these paradoxes in regard to paranormal encounters with creatures. Um, and then, you know, the third thing that we need to keep in mind is people just make up a bunch of crap. Um, and that is an important factor. People imagine things. A lot of people are psychotic, especially people who want internet fame. And they'll invent stories or embellish stories. Someone will say, for example, I saw a Bigfoot and describe the Bigfoot in great detail. But but if you really investigate the matter and 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 interview the individual penetrating into the details, you'll find out that they saw something out of the corner of their eye. They don't really know what it was, but they've confabulated all of these details to convince themselves that it was a Bigfoot. And that story gets passed around on the internet and everyone thinks that, you know, it's it's taken as as Bigfoot gospel and added into the compendium of data in right. regard to the Bigfoot. It's that, that happens more often than not. I my position with paranormal encounters is I have a I have a default position of disbelief. My default is I don't believe you. And and I don't believe myself either by the way because I understand the problems with human perception. I understand the the tendency for exaggeration and hyperbole especially in this day and age of social media yep, and people wanting to get, you know, eyeballs on content, things like that. So my default is disbelief. I disbelieve you unless we talk and I start to, you give me reasons to believe or to suspect that you might be telling the truth. And then I start to become sympathetic, right? Sym sympathetic to the idea that, that you're recounting something that actually happened because my, again, my default is, People are exaggerating. There's hyperbole. They're making crap up for whatever reason. And I would say that that alone explains 80% of what's on the internet. Uh, and then you, you, so you can, you can, you can take that 80% of, of hyperbole, exaggeration, and fictional material that people are passing as nonfiction take that 80% of that content and throw it in the garbage and focus on the 20% that's left and then drill down on that 20% and see what sort of patterns you can derive from what's left. And it's very difficult to do that, obviously, because we don't all have access to the purveyors of these stories and of these, and of this information. And it's, it's important. And I think it's very useful, um, you know, to get as many stories as we can in regard to Bigfoot, in regard to dogmen, all these kind of things. That's important because that's all we have. Um, you know, the scientific community isn't producing anything on these on this phenomena, on these phenomena. 
And obviously, I think it's, I, I honestly think it is exceedingly evident that Bigfoot exists. <laughs> I, I really do. I think it is, I think it is, it, it is, it is at this point nearly a scientific fact that Bigfoot exists because of all the anecdotal evidence, the footprints, right? All of the encounters, um, even considering that 80% of them are, are probably hoaxed or exaggerated or invented. Um, and all we have are really the stories to analyze. And the stories are, are very intriguing. And I don't know, even remember what your question was and how I got to where I am right now. But, <laughs> but the, the, you know, that's, that's my, my, my admonition, my suggestion is consume as much information as you can in regard to these cryptids, but be default to disbelief. Let your default be one of disbelief. And until somebody gives you good reason to believe that their story is true. I don't even know why I ended up on that point, but I did. That's a good one. Um, you know, it's funny you mention those things because <clears throat> uh, one of the first interviews I did was with a gentleman by the name of Matt Emsch. And um, honestly, I hadn't, I, I had met him last year and I, I never heard a story. And, you know, we kind of kicked around the idea of like me interviewing him. I was like, oh, sure. Okay. Like, what's your story? <clears throat> Sorry about that. And, uh, you know, we did the interview and having never heard a story before and as he's recounting it to me honestly like you were saying like you become sympathetic because as he, he wasn't just telling a story he, it's almost like as i'm watching him recount the experience it, it was almost like watching somebody relive a traumatic experience and i could see his body language and i could see him getting shooken up and i could see just him reliving it and i and I'm, i remember like feeling that it was so like raw and i was like oh my gosh like yes something happened to this guy that right. traumatized him to such a degree and you know just hearing his multiple iterations on different other podcasts i'm like all the details are pinpoint and so i i i remember that was really the first encounter that really like shook me because i'm like it's more than just somebody sending an email right or somebody posting on reddit that was like you could see that the, the visceral reaction of them reliving it and it's like there's something going on like there's really something to this and yeah and that is that's that's part of what i look for when i talk to people who've had a an extraordinary experience like that um do they believe it do they believe it does their body language convey right that they believe it and and that is a that is a, a very important factor when 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 you know when investigating these sort of topics it's not the only one i mean sometimes people have told the story a hundred times yeah yeah so they're just sort of dead to the emotion that was once attached to it they've told it a thousand you know a hundred times thousand right. times so it's it's very wooden to them at this point there's the, all that emotion has since subsided but and actors but for people, they're actors too <laughs> and there's yeah, and, there, and actors that's right but and then you have people who don't really tell the story because they think well people are gonna think i'm crazy yeah so they rarely tell it unless in, in private and when you get those stories yeah, yeah you oftentimes you will get that visceral emotional reaction right that is visible in their body language when they're telling you a story that's a very important component of yep. of of detecting whether or not there may be some truth to a story it's not the only one but it's a very important component and i i absolutely believe many many people across the country have interfaced with bigfoot have either seen him or heard him or seen his uh footprints i think it is i would say as paranormal experiences go it's probably the most common one uh in in regard to cryptids and i've certainly know i don't know a whole lot of people like i don't have a, a, a lot of people who are direct acquaintances of mine i live in kind of a small social world right. outside of the internet right. right outside of the people who follow me on the internet but in my actual social world my friendship circles which is not very big i know you know probably five people who've encountered bigfoot which is right. a whole lot Right. And I believe them all because I know them and, and their stories are compelling. And, and so it's, it's, 
I do live in Montana, so that helps. <laughs> yeah, you are close to Yellowstone too. Bunch mm-hmm. of stuff around there, but that that's a whole other thing. <laughs> so I think that um, I think that shows like yours that highlight these things and cryptids, and I think they're very useful. And I think that uh, eventually. Eventually, because of guys like you, eventually the scientific community is is going to come to the realization that let's be specific to Sasquatch that the Sasquatch is real. Eventually, it's just mounting, right? It's like the pressure is mounting, the evidence is mounting, and there's too much. I mean, there's just mountains of anecdotal evidence. Somebody just sent me yesterday footprints. Bigfoot footprints. And this, these people are not on, they don't even, I don't even think they have social media or even a cell phone. They just live out in the, they live in the wilderness basically and just want to be left alone. But yet they have, they have footprints of Bigfoot and handprints and very compelling evidence that the creature is real. And they're not looking to publish it or anything. So uh, eventually there's going to be so much anecdotal evidence that I think within our lifetime, reality of the existence of bigfoot is going to become accepted by the scientific community and i don't know why i i I felt impelled to make that statement but there it is well you know it's interesting because for some people there will never be good enough evidence i mean the stuff out there right now you know some people complain that it's shot on an old cell phone but you know if you were to take an image with, you know, a really good DSLR camera, then, then they would say, well, it's too clear, so it has to be a hoax. So I think for some people, they're looking for reasons to disbelieve. There will never be good enough evidence. But um, for some people who've had experiences and for some people that just like, you know, it's almost, it's like when you get the right evidence, I don't know. But I don't know if there's ever going to be the, the right evidence is that to the... like finally convince the public where it's like, oh, this is a thing. It's not just, you know. The, the problem is that I think that elements of our government are well aware of the Bigfoot right. creature, well aware of it. And I think that the problem is that one of the one of the barriers to disclosing something extraordinary like the existence of a Bigfoot is the inability to explain it. In other words, if elements of our government know that the Bigfoot exists and perhaps elements of the scientific community working probably within agencies in the government know that Bigfoot exists. They, they're not going to announce it to the public because they don't know exactly what it is or how to explain it. Right. And so they're not going to come out and do that and A, look foolish and B, potentially be opening the floodgate to a whole lot of other questions and overturning perhaps conceptual norms. Yeah. 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 That, that could cause yeah. that could cause all kind that could that could cause all kinds of havoc and distrust in the government. What else do you know? Wait a minute, you've known about this for this yeah. long. What else are you hiding from us? And I think a lot of people have if let's say elements of the US government were to come forth and, and, and disclose the existence of the Bigfoot, then I think people would axiomatically assume that they're also hiding the evidence for aliens, right? I yep. mean, yep. you've been concealing this one all this time, so I think we're just going to go ahead and assume that you got the body, you got the bodies of gray aliens, Room Lake or or Wright Patterson or something like that. So so it's it becomes very it's an it's enmeshed. It's very tangled, sticky situation. You a you cannot you're not going to disclose what you cannot explain. And B, you're not going to dis- ex- disclose something that's going to give rise to further distrust of those governmental institutions. So though that that's that's the reason why you know these kind of things remain secrets for so long. And I'm not I'm not one who believes in all cryptid stories. I don't I don't I you know I'm not sure if I believe in the dog man, I don't really know enough about it. Um, I'm not sure if I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. I probably don't. Uh, I probably don't believe in Mothman. Um, I, don't, I don't think I believe in most cryptids. I'm just absolutely convinced that Bigfoot is real. 
Well, you know, that that's a good position because I always try to tell people, maybe I, I don't tell it enough, but I, I always say, listen, like if, if I'm going to tell an account or just a, a piece of historical anecdotal evidence, you know, a story, just t- take it with a grain of salt. Cause that, that's all you can do. You're like, listen, it, it's, 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 it supposedly happened. It led to this thing, but other than this secondhand account or this firsthand account, like we, we don't really know. So I just present it as is. It's really up to you to come to the conclusion that it's either real or not. You know, um, unfortunately, we'll never have enough evidence or proof, especially if it's like something that dates back. You, you'll never know for sure. Um, and like you mentioned, the perception thing, was it just misperception of something? We don't know. So it, it really makes it really fascinating because there's just this this mystery enveloping the entire topic branch. And I think, like you were saying earlier, people want answers. And it's just, there's so many gray areas. And, and there's not, um, people don't know what to do or where to find answers at. I don't think there really is a place to find answers at. Um, so it kind of, like I said, it kind of makes it this large, just foggy mystery where, you know, where you're like, oh, like, are these all interconnected? Like, what's going on? This doesn't make any sense. And then after some time in this topic field, you start to see things are interconnected, you know, like with cryptid encounters and like, you know, alien abductions, and you kind of get into the whole like ancient civilizations and, and the Nephilim and people start to make these connections like, oh, like in some way, shape or form, there is relations here. They're which, looking for an explanation. Yeah. Yeah. But nobody really knows how. Because none has been none. None has been forthcoming. Right. From, from any institution. And so they have to kind of invent or formulate their own explanation based on oftentimes their limited understanding of a wide variety of topics yep and so people will take uh pieces and parts of different topics and sort of try and assemble a unified field theory right a, yep. a, a, a theory of everything yep and and that's oftentimes what people are are really attempting for their own world view they're trying to assemble a theory of everything um i don't necessarily engage indulge in attempting to formulate a theory of everything a unified field theory so to speak of all of these bizarre topics. I sort of look at each one of them independently and I don't need a connection. For example, I don't feel the need to make a connection between Bigfoot and Nephilim, like we were talking about earlier. I don't feel that that is a necessary nexus uh, that, that, that needs to be somehow established in order for me to understand the phenomena. Um, I can examine the Bigfoot creature in its own context. I can examine alien abduction in its own context. I can examine um, biblical giants in their own context. I don't need connective tissue. And I think that perhaps distinguishes me in perhaps from a lot of other researchers who come from a biblical perspective like I do but who feel the need, who feel compelled to to somehow develop connective tissue between the, the, the text of the Old and New Testament to Bigfoot or to alien abduction or to whatever phenomenon. And, and I simply don't feel compelled to do that. I'm certainly not obliged to do it. And I just think the universe is really big and really mysterious and that we know almost nothing about it. Yeah. And that um, that the very little, me as a Christian, the very little information that I have in the biblical corpus, I don't expect it to answer all the questions. Right. I expect it to communicate the gospel of Christ to me, and it does so very effectively. Um, but I don't expect it to tell me what Bigfoot is. And I don't expect it to, to tell me to answer any questions whatsoever in regard to alien abduction. Right. Now you can derive general, a, a very general world view. Um, for example, there's a, there's a universe in which there's the kingdom of heaven exists. And then the so-called, you know, the quote unquote kingdom of darkness in which you have good actors and bad actors. And perhaps some of these things fall on one or the other side. Okay, that's a very generalized worldview, which I think is is very appropriate. But but getting specific becomes problematic when you 
when you try and look for, for example, the origin, the exact specific origin of dog man in the Old Testament, something like that, right, becomes very problematic because you have, you're so limited in the tools that are available to you. Uh, you're, you're limited in even the terminology available to you from the Old Testament. You have like one word to explain all the weird stuff, Nephilim, right? And I think that that, that, that is the, returning to this subject, that that is the, the default for so many people. If, it, if it's weird, if it's non-human, if it's paranormal, Nephilim, because that's what the, 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 the biblical toolkit gives me. But it's, I think it's just a flawed perspective because that's just one thing that the biblical narrative happens to inform you about. One thing. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the biblical corpus is encompassing all reality, uh, all sentient beings that are in the game, so to speak. Um, and uh, that's that I think that distinguishes me in regard to my approach to research. I don't come with a box. I don't come to the table with a box. And this is my box. This is my paradigm. And everything I research is going to fit into this box. Right. I don't do that because that's not research. That's not research. That's how a lot it's of people approach it. It's not scientific inquiry. And, and you can't rightly define yourself as a researcher if you do that. You, you have to come to the table with nothing in your hands. You know, obviously everybody has a worldview, but you don't force anything to fit inside of your perspective, your paradigm. You simply come to the, to the investigation with an open mind. And if something doesn't fit into my box, my paradigm, I don't modify what I'm looking at so that it will fit. I simply enlarge my paradigm to accommodate what I'm looking at. You see what I mean? So there's a difference there. There's a difference in approach in regard to investigation. And I wish more people would employ this approach. Don't, don't come with your bucket uh, when you go and investigate whatever topic it is. And this usually, this doesn't, by the way, this isn't exclusive to the Bible believing community. This happens a lot with the ancient, probably the most egregious example is the ancient astronaut theorists. They come with that bucket everywhere they go. Everything they look at has to fit inside of that paradigm. Um, or the Sitchinites, who are part of the ancient astronaut theorist community, the Sitchinites have to, everything has to have connective tissue back to the Anunnaki and the Sitchin's mistranslation of the um, Sumerian cylinder seals. And so, you know, you have, you have, and then you have another faction, another group that approaches every topic from this galactic federation perspective, where there's like this galactic federation of benevolent ETs, right? And every topic they approach, even if it's something that is dark and sinister, like alien abduction, has to fit inside of their paradigm. And that's why so many of those people have a hard time accepting the obvious malevolence of the gray aliens. They have a hard time. They have to construe some sort of wonderful benevolence as it pertains to alien abduction and the activity of the grace, which is absurd. And they have to do it because it doesn't fit in there. So everybody's coming to the table with a bucket, all right? That bucket represents their paradigm. And rather than, and it's usually very rigid, okay? I, and I'm sure I do that to some extent, but I try and have a very flexible paradigm. My paradigm is not made out of hard plastic. Okay. It's, it's flexible. And, and, and I just flex it to encompass something that doesn't currently fit. I, I broaden the paradigm. And when you do that, man, it's really easy to just accommodate all kinds of stuff. Right. And, and you can examine each topic independent of the other topics. They don't have to have connective tissue. Do they? Maybe. Oh, in the broader scheme of things, certainly everything is connected. Everything is synergistic in the broader scheme, right? But that's the big picture. That's the big philosophical view, which doesn't really answer the details 
right? It doesn't really tell you what the heck the Bigfoot is, right? Right. That's just this broad philosophical view. But if you really want to understand something, you have to get granular with it. You have to get in there and you have to dissect it. And and if you're always trying to to to, to create this matrix, this nexus, and you bring you're, you're you're stretching over the Nephilim thing and trying to force it into the Bigfoot thing, then you're always going to get a skewed comprehension, factual environment that you're investigating. I don't know if that made any sense. So rather than just allowing the the data to speak for itself, you're going to always be intermixing stuff so that it conforms to this other thing that you want it to con- that you want to connect to. And and that happens a lot. And I think it's natural for us to do that. So I'm not sitting here trying to berate people who do that. I think it's just natural. Our brains, because, yeah. you know, you, you set me off on this thought because we're, t- we're talking about a unified theory of all of this weird porn, uh, paranormal um, cryptid type stuff. Everybody wants a theory of everything right. that explains all of it. And that's great. And there may be one out there, but I think, you know, the problem is everybody has their own theory of everything. And you end up in camps. Like I said, you end up in the Nephilim camp or you end up in the Anunnaki camp or you end up in the Galactic Federation camp or some other camp. I don't like the camps. I don't like them. I, I want to have an independent analysis and just walk away with what seems most plausible, whether or not, whether or not it affirms uh, some other idea that I have. So, um, I, I guess it's sort of a soapbox rant there, but, and I'm not saying that I'm really, really good at this. I'm saying that this is what I'm aiming for. This is what I'm aiming for. Um, and, uh, I, I encourage people to do the same. And, and that way collectively as a community, we can, we can, you know, if you just, if you disconnect these pieces, by the way, I was about to grab some props here. Yeah, no oh, worries. This is, this is useful. Uh, I was grabbing my proof copies of my book of Enoch, which I'm which I'm um, publishing in collaboration with uh, Blurry Creatures Podcast. Uh, but I was going to grab these props. So here's also it's also a convenient plug. It's coming out <laughs> on the 11th of June. So if this broadcast comes out after the 11th of June, this is available for purchase. If it comes out before the 11th of June, this is coming. On the eleventh of June, it's it's it includes um, my commentary and and concept scenes on the book of the Watchers, um, and Nate does the uh, we have some we have some awesome we have some awesome um, I'm trying to I'm trying to flip to a page here illustrations some really great uh, illustrations in here that Nate generated um, that go along with like you see the illustration. And then on this side is my is a conceptual scene that, that that comes out of my brain in regard to the narrative from the Book of Enoch. So I'm 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 sort of and it is the it is first, second, and third Enoch with commentary on the Book of the Watchers and illustrations. And the conceptual scenes are sort of my pers- it's it's giving you food for thought. My perception of of what these scenes look like. Right. For That's example, so cool. For example, you have this one here, which is the Watchers descending on Hermon. You notice anything interesting about that scene? Let's see if uh, I can. That looks like a UFO, Nate, don't Nate it? Henry, Nate Henry from Blurry Creatures generated this image. You see anything interesting? I know it's hard to see. So I've got the Watchers descending. There's two things you might find interesting about this. Number one, our Watchers don't have wings because I don't because angels don't have wings in the biblical narrative. Number two, there's a flying saucer in the sky. Yep. So basically, our conceptualization is that the Watchers arrive to Hermon at the helms of advanced aerospace vehicles. So that just gives you an idea and uh, of how different we conceptualize the story of the Watchers in the Book of Enoch. So if you're interested in the Book of Enoch, this is just a quick shameless plug here. And I didn't mean to plug. I literally was going to do a plug. No, no, uh, please plug. Plug your book, too, by the way. This is the proof. (laughs) copy but the 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 so again if this is after june 11th you can go get this book right now on amazon just type in you know el barino book of enoch or something like that you'll get our book of enoch that's the cover and this is this is a proof copy so you have this you know not for print or whatever it says there that won't be on the final copy but this is what our cover looks like so look for that book if you want our edition um 
and you get this on Amazon. Okay, so what I was gonna say was, <laughs> I did that was a that was an unintentional plug. Okay, I grabbed these. <laughs> I happen to be working on it, so I, I grabbed. So the point is, you know, sometimes people have, and these are the props. Say this is the Nephilim uh, paradigm, and and or rather, this is this is the topic of Nephilim, and over here is Bigfoot. And right now, so many people have them connected, and that's fine. They very well may be, but but I think it's very useful, even if this is your perception. I'm not saying talking about you specifically. I have no idea what you think about Bigfoot, but but if this is your perception, it's very very it's a very good exercise to intentionally divide, separate these topics, put the Nephilim down for a minute, and try and and conceptualize the Bigfoot topic without Nephilim in view. Because at the very least, you're going to come up with some new ideas. And then if it, and then if at the end of the day, that seems like the most plausible explanation, then put them back together. But I think people need to be practicing that, especially the, the ancient, ancient astronaut people. Ancient, ancient astronaut theorists need to really engage in that sort of intellectual exercise because they're married to their view, I would say, to some extent, to some extent, depending on the topic, even more um, vigorously than than some Christians are married to the biblical view in regard to an explanation for Bigfoot or an explanation right. for the pyramids or an explanation for the megaliths. That's what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and ancient astronaut theorists are sometimes much more tenacious. Or and that encompasses, I suppose, also the Sitchinites, the the acolytes of Ze Ze Zechariah Sitchin, uh, are very, very tenacious about that particular paradigm being true. It's necessarily true um, to them when they're thinking about Bigfoot, when they're thinking about alien abduction, and so forth. I think I'm, I think I'm just talking in circles at this point. So maybe we should just wrap this up. <laughs> Well, before I wrap it up, please plug your book because that's why I really wanted you to. My book, uh, I have that prop as well sitting on my desk. So I, I wrote a book called Birthright, The Coming Post-Human Apocalypse and the Usurpation of Adam's Dominion on Planet Earth, <clears throat> which I talk about. I don't think I talk about Bigfoot in this book, but um, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a, you, you, people will find it fascinating. I cover all kinds of territory in this book, and I, I talk about aliens a lot in this book for one thing and within the within a biblical context um and um uh transhumanism i talk about uh the occult i talk about uh, the genesis 6 affair the book of enoch it's all in there so if you want to get that you can go to amazon it's called birthright um and then also for people who want to for people who are interested in joining a community of individuals who are constantly thinking in these terms and playing with ideas and trying to grow in knowledge and and this sort of a community that is um, created for this sort of inquiry. I have a members community called the El Brino Analysis Members Community. It's a subscription community. So there's no trolls in there. We have hundreds of people in there, and we're constantly engaging in these kinds of topics. There's a, it's like a, it's like my own personal Facebook, uh, my own personal social media platform. I have, I have an app for it. Um, sign up on the website though, because you get the, you'll get it cheaper than on the app. But you'll get the app included in when you become a member. You get the app, um, and I have, I do, I do private briefings. Uh, I do. Um, live stream Q and A sessions weekly. We have a book club where we all are reviewing a book together, and then we jump on a a, a Zoom chat, uh, a Zoom uh, call, and people are logging in with their cameras and mics, and we're having an open conversation about well, kind of like you and I did today, actually. And all of this is happening inside of my community, and it's growing rapidly. People are loving it. It's again, it's like my own social media platform, and I'm putting out all kinds of additional content if you if you subscribe for an annual membership on my if you sign up for an annual membership you're going to get included in this community you're going to get access to three episodes that i've developed completed professional tv quality episodes that no one else has seen it's a pre-screening of this tv show it's not published yet and it's included in the annual membership and uh you know it, it documents my uh 
expedition to the lost city in the Andes. It documents my investigation of the elongated skulls where we took DNA samples. Um, it, 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 we talk about megaliths and all kinds of things, giants, and, and that's included in the annual membership. So go over to the elberinoanalysis.com if you want to become a member in our community. It's a lot of fun. And I think uh, it's growing rapidly and it's, it's just really a great place for exploring these topics. So hop on that folks. That sounds like a pretty, pretty cool community to be a part of. All right, Timothy, do you have any last closing thoughts you want to throw on? Uh, if not, no, I that's think that's cool. it. All right. I think that's, I really appreciate, appreciate you uh, engaging in this conversation with me um, and inviting me on your show. Uh, I, I, I apologize for all of the ranting I did. <laughs> hey, sometimes that leads to good conversation, though. That's why I, I said, hey, let's just going to be open and free form. Like, there's no, it doesn't need to be like cut and paste, you know, or it's like I ask a question, you got to give me an answer. It's just pe people want more than ever. They want that human connectivity with just two people having dialogue, you know, that it's, it's more real. Well, the problem is, you know, the problem is you give, you give Timothy Albrino a second cup of coffee and there's no telling what's going to happen. So, <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, if you'd be willing to come back on to a second one sometime, I, I'd probably say probably in the coming months, we'll, we'll, we'll be in communication back and forth. Because honestly, man, there, there's so many topics I didn't get a chance to pick your brain about. I mean, there's just so many things. So, sure. um, yeah, it, Definitely. It, if you would be willing to do that, I'd be greatly appreciated. But uh, I just want to say thank you Definitely. so much for having the time to come up and do this. And uh, yeah. I'll see you later, folks. All right. It was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, Josh.